like sunshine, like springtime, like something's in the water and I'm taking a deep dive. I'm feeling so weightless, like I'm gonna make it, and nothing in the universe can take this. I can see it clearly now, nothing gonna bring me down. Welcome and thank you for joining the National University of Singapore Yong Lu Lin School of Medicine's uh, Healthy Longevity webinar series. Uh, we're very fortunate tonight. We have the president of the National Academy of Medicine, uh, Victor Zhao, uh, to get, giving us a, an overview of the NA, National Academy of Medicine views on uh, healthy longevity. Uh, and this is the first uh, show of the Ch new Chinese New Year. So there's a lot of pressure on you, Victor. Uh, so I'll let you worry about that first. And before we start with you, we're going to go to a postdoctoral fellow in the program, Jacinda Lee, and she's going to tell us about a recent paper using CRISPR screens to identify factors controlling cellular senescence. Thank you. I'm Jacinda Lee, a postdoc from Prof. Brian Kennedy's lab. Thank you for the opportunity to present today. Today, I'll be presenting to you this paper published in January 2021, titled A Genome-Wide CRISPR-Based Screen identifies CAT7 as a driver of cellular senescence. So as you may know, there are not many data out there regarding aging associated genes. And this is exactly what the authors are actually interested in, in finding genes that are directly associated with aging and to help to find a potential target to slow its progression. So the authors have done a lot of work, so I shall attempt to summarize them the best that I can. Firstly, they use cells that age rapidly for screening and by using these cells, it actually helps hasten the process to identify the genes involved. So they use CRISPR, a genetic manipulation tool. So they were able to turn off a lot of genes at one go, one at a time actually, to identify those genes that actually that can help prevent cell aging. So of these genes, they actually found CAT7 to be one of the top targets. So CAT7 is actually a histone acetyltransferase, a protein found in the nucleus of the cells. So what does this CAT7 actually do to help uh, affect aging? So the authors actually reduce the amount of CAT7 in genes, uh, in the, pro the CAT7 proteins in these cells and to help uh, to investigate how it works. So they found that cells with CAT7 turned off actually have better growth compared to those without. And they also found that these cells with CAT7 turned off actually has less inflammation and better nuclear control which is actually important for a healthy cell. Also, you can see here on the bottom right, the rightmost columns are cells that have the, actually the CAT7 turned off, and they resemble more of the first column, which are actually wild-type healthy cells. And in the middle two columns are actually profiles of the aging cells. Now that they show that actually CAT7 can actually prevent aging and it's not just a fluke, so they went on to investigate how does the what is the mechanism involved actually in this. So using multiple assays, they found that CAT7 actually affects a specific protein called the H3K14 protein. Therefore, it, basically it means that CAT7 actually decreases H3K14 acetylation, which in turn decreases the protein level of another protein called P15E4B. And this therefore, they therefore established a CAT7 P15-ink-4B relationship in the cells that this is involved, actually, this is the mechanism involved in aging. So with this interesting finding, they actually went back to look at some human uh, sample data. They actually took some samples from 20-year-olds and then ran it alongside 
samples from 80 year olds and in over here you can see samples from 20 year olds actually have less cat7 and less p15 in 4b as shown by the lighter bands whereas in the aged uh, samples they found more cat7 and more p15 in 4b uh, shown by the darker bands and this actually agrees with the previous cell results and all this data strongly suggests that cat7 is indeed involved in aging so all this data has been done uh, in cell, but how does that actually translate to moving organisms into humans, maybe, perhaps? So what they did was they actually got hold of some 20-month-old mice. And as a proof of concept, they actually did some CAT7 manipulation. They actually injected these mice with this CAT7 lentivirus to turn off these proteins in the mice. And then they observed the lifespan and health span of these mice through their life. So they found that these mice with the CAT7 turn off actually are more mobile and they actually, they actually live longer des, than those mice with the CAT7 still on. Looking at the samples of the mice after they pass, they actually found that these mice with CAT7 turn off actually also have lower inflammation and better, better cellular control, better nucleus control. So other than doing it on one mice, which once again may be a fluke, as scientists, they actually Use it, another on, use it on another mouse model of aging. So once again, they injected those mouse model with CAT7 lentivirus, turned off the gene and observed. And once again, they found that the loss of CAT7 actually helped deplete P15 in 4B and actually delayed aging in those mice as well. So by doing these experiments in two different mouse models, they actually really proved that CAT7 is involved in aging and that manipulating them can actually help uh, delay the progression of aging. So in conclusion, this group, Wang et al, actually found that genes and proteins that are directly involved in aging and that tweaking them can actually help delay aging. And in a bigger view, they demonstrated that gene therapy can, is actually a possibility when it comes to aging prevention. So with that, I'll end here. Thank you. Thank you, Jacinda. Um, so it's a great pleasure to introduce Victor Zhao. Uh, he served nearly 10 years as Chancellor for Health Affairs at Duke University and as President and CEO for Duke University Health System. Before that, he held a number of influential posts at prestigious institutions, including Harvard, uh, Brigham and William, Women's, uh, Stanford, uh, and other places. He's an international recognized uh, trailblazer in translational research, health innovation, and global healthcare strategy and delivery. Today, he'll be telling us about the National Academy of Medicine's focus on uh, the uh, healthy longevity and their grand challenge. Thanks a lot for coming on the show, Victor. Thank you, Brian. Happy New Year. Okay. Uh, this is the year of the ox. That's how I feel, although I'm only 65. So we're here to talk about health longevity. I hope I'll be a, a, a model of health longevity. <laughs> so the main thing I want to talk about is what we're trying to do at National Academy of Medicine. And we've launched a grand challenge in health longevity. Now, may I have the next slide? So the, the world's population is aging. We know this. And this slide on the upper left side shows you in gold, that is the number of percent of the population over 65 over time. And in blue, the percent of population less than age five uh, over time, you can see the two lines cross. And guess what? In 2019, 2020 is when the lines cross, which means now globally, there are more people older like me over 65 than those less than five. Now this trend, as you can see, is going to be even more exaggerated uh, over the next 20, 30 years. At the bottom of the slide shows you what we call the human pyramid. That is the demographic uh, data in terms of population. On the left-hand side, 1970, you can see it's looked like a pyramid. A lot of people are younger at the bottom and a few on the top. By 2015, you can see it's beginning to compress, looking like the Empire State Building. And of course, in some countries now in 2021, in fact, it's a rectangle and some, in fact, may start inverting. 
In Singapore, you have one of the longest life expectancy in the world. And I know your population is, uh, is aging and more and more people are over 65. Now, how does aging population impact uh, the society and individuals? What I've shown here on the right side, it says that really impacts families, communities, societies, industry, and even economic function, how they function. For example, we all know that older population have more infirmities, more chronic disease, more, a greater prevalence of Alzheimer's, uh, hypertension, osteoporosis, you name it. Also, therefore, plays a great demand on healthcare delivery and hence the financing of healthcare. As our family structure is changing and you have more, now more older population, that really changes the relationship of most of the families. And it changes the social infrastructure and importantly, insurance and retirement programs and workforce and composition. And I'll talk briefly about all these areas in a few minutes. Next slide. So the question is, are we prepared? The, uh, so I've taken a few studies like the Global Age Watch and CSIS studies to say, how does the world look in terms of preparation for the aging population? And the results are very mixed. And in fact, few countries have made really significant programs uh, of progress. Certainly in our countries, I don't think we have done as quite as much for this population. And as the studies show, many countries that do well in one dimension do poorly on the other. So few countries fail to score well in all dimensions of aging preparedness. Uh, Singapore has done quite well. My knowledge is that you have an all of society approach, which is wonderful. But I think overall, globally, we need to prepare financially, socially, and scientifically for longer lifespan. It's a global imperative. Next slide, please. So the question is, what do we need to do? How to effectively prepare and better equip ourselves for an aging and health longevity globally? There are four domains as shown in this slide. And on the top is personal, social, economic, and uh, environmental determinants. Uh, on the left-hand side, at nine o'clock is clinical medicine and health delivery systems. And then on the right-hand side would be science, technology, and innovation. And finally, policy and practice. All these intersect and influence how the population ages and what kind of society do we live in. I'm gonna take a minute on each one of these to really tee up why we launched this global grand challenge for National Academy of Medicine. Next slide. So let's talk about an important issue, personal social environmental determinants. You know, elderly, frequently live alone and they feel isolated. Sometimes they feel so lonely and socially disconnected. And that's really an important issue because data has shown that if you're isolated or feel lonely, in fact, overall health does less well than those who are interconnected and active. That leads to the activities of daily living you know, how do you, what do you do, whether you socialize, you're active, all that matters. And of course, in many of the older population, safety, security is really important. I think for many of us, a sense of purpose. You know, I, my own feeling is I'm still working actively. I feel really good because I have a sense of purpose. I feel I'm contributing to the world. And the ability to contribute in a meaningful way to society is really important. Next slide. <clears throat> of course, when it comes to health, we do know that there are many age-related disease. Elderly population have sometimes three to four times the incidence of the younger population, hypertension, diabetes, uh, cancer, and others. So shifting to chronic disease. But of course, we really worry about Alzheimer's, uh, mental disorder, and dementia. As you can see in the third bullet, an age-related disease, there's a whole series of illnesses like delirium, frailty, degenerative joint, hearing loss, depression, anxiety that afflicts the elderly more than the younger population. But we, we're not living in a world which, in which healthcare 
is actually very well suited for the older population, certainly not in the United States. Uh, you know, we tend to think about acute emergency care. We think about post-chronic care, rehab, uh, but we don't think enough about preventive care, palliative care, and important long-term care. What I show in the slide is say, in the United States, most long-term care are read at home by family members, and people have to volunteer the time, we call it informal workforce, and they're not reimbursed. So it's a tremendous strain on the families. And of course, we don't have enough people working in the elder care uh, workforce. I think one really important issue is in our country is the disconnect between medical and social services. I know you do much better, but in our country, you see the doctor, you get medical care, but if you need social services, you have to go to another agency versus now we're pushing for the integration of health and social services. And finally, of course, financing is always a problem. How do we pay for the increasing demand on healthcare services? Next slide. So if you look at the next slide, policy and finances are important. The governments globally are contending with rising healthcare costs because uh, we are, have higher need and high cost patients. Uh, sustainability of social insurance and benefit systems. Now I know in Singapore you do much better and I'm very proud of it. By the way, I'm an honorary citizen of Singapore. So I'm a member of the family. You do much better, but still it remains to be a challenge as time goes on. And of course, as I said, uh, people retire. So as you have fewer younger population, you have a sh shrinking ratio of workers to pensioners. And of course, many countries are dealing with what's the official age of retirement? Should there be one? Next slide. So as I sh think about the other dimension is science and technology. And you just heard a paper uh, in which uh, Jacinda Lee presented. I think science holds the promise of solutions. For example, if you think about digital technology, data, digital AI application automation, Ubers, bio sensors, many others, that could be very helpful to the older population. And uh, our medical uh, sciences, you heard the paper about CATS, or CAT7, if you will. And uh, very importantly, you can see, you can target the genes, the pathways for molecular therapies, gene editing, regenerative medicine, and gene therapy. And finally, there is about and tissue engineering. So these four domains are really important. Next slide. So our question becomes, how do you actually address all these four domains in order to achieve a health longevity? After a good amount of assessment, we decided at National Academy of Medicine that we'll launch a grand challenge, a grand challenge of health longevity. Now, what's a grand challenge? In our terms, it's a public-private partnership. It's not only academia, but to mobilize the entire society to address this issue. We hope to mobilize young people, intergenerational, older people, people in academia, in government, in industry, business, all to work towards solutions. So our grand challenge called health longevity is to address the following five points. A comprehensive addressing challenges and opportunities presented by global population aging. Second, address the social, economic, political, and other environmental factors that affect health of the older population. Third, to catalyze breakthrough ideas and research that can extend human health span. Fourth is to generate transformative and scalable innovations worldwide. And most importantly, to create a dynamic network of support <clears throat> for health longevity, looking at healthcare, social factors, economics, research, innovation, industry, policy, community, and beyond. Now, what is the bottom line here? The bottom line is you don't have to think about, the, as you age, frailty and chronic disease. 
it's an opportunity to improve health of this population. So we're moving from lifespan to health span. While lifespan extension is a reality, we need to increase health span. And by increasing health span, you have more people who can be productive, can be happy, can in fact contribute to society. And this therefore will be good for all of society. Next slide. So what do we have in mind for this grand challenge? The two components, one is called a roadmap on the left, which is to conduct a comprehensive assessment globally in terms of challenging and aging opportunities, not just in US, not in Singapore, but a global addressing this issue so that we can recommend promising solutions for policymakers, government, non-government organization, private sector to improve health, productivity and quality of life as people age. The right side is a global competition. We want to bring more people into the field, create a movement, particularly younger scientists, to catalyze breakthrough ideas and research that can extend health span and achieve transformative and scalable innovations and build a broad ecosystem of support. Next slide. So let me talk about the roadmap. This roadmap is a true international activity. We created an international commission and I chair the roadmap along with my co-chairs, John Jenkins from AARP and Keizo Takemi, parliamentarian and global health ambassador from Japan. The co-chairs are Linda Fried from Columbia University and your own John Wong from NUS. And in fact, John is a major player and the whole commission is made of international members from everywhere, every continent. These are experts, but we come together, share experiences, and how do we get that roadmap done? You can see in the middle column are three separate boxes. They're the three work streams. They reflect what I talked about in the four domains. And at the bottom cross-cutting is a fourth domain. So you can see first on the left side, social, behavioral, environmental enablers. So we want to have a group to work on that, a group in the middle work on healthcare systems and public health, and a group work on science and technology and ask the question, where are we today? And how can we make changes that can improve and policy changes and practice changes that can improve the health of the older population? So the bottom and cross cutting is policy and practice, health equity, disparities, innovation, financing, and monitoring metrics. Now, equity is a central piece of this because we want everybody have the same potential of being able to live healthy when they age. Next slide. So John Wong and Linda, in fact, I'll be speaking to them later today, are leading this work. And you can see back in February, a year ago, it's 2020, not 2021, by the way, I came to Singapore and I, you know, and we held this workshop, which is the work stream that's the second work stream, if you remember, that we had a great uh, attendance. And in fact, I interviewed by your newspapers, Trade Times and others, and I said, COVID-19, I have confidence that Singapore will take good care of it because it's a public health system and you guys have done quite well compared to our country. Next slide. So you can see this is still work in progress. We hope to have this report released uh, later this year. And I think this report will be helpful to practitioners, policymakers, every sector to come together to change the way we do things and improve health of the elderly. The second arm is a global competition. Next slide. And the idea behind this is that if we delay or interrupt the biological process associated with disease and aging, as you heard Jacinda Lee just talked about in CAT7, we can prevent in human, in this case, illness, disease, and loss of function. And also we use technology to transform the way we age. We can change the, improve the activities of, day, of daily living and improve quality accessibility of healthcare for the elderly. That's the whole idea behind this. Biological sciences and technology, next slide. And so quickly, um, I think there's a lot of research now being done and more and more 
uh, in terms of uh, biology aging. I've listed only some of them. Metabolic stress, mitochondrial dysfunction, cellular senescence, autophagy, cellular regeneration, DNA damage and repair, telomere, uh, telomere dysfunction. We know some longevity genes and of course epigenetics. Now time will not permit to get into details of this, except I'm going to touch on them to show you how this can be translated into, in fact, potential human treatment. Next slide. Now, so uh, now there's a lot of work done in model organism, such as Saccharomyces, C. elegans, Drosophila, Musculus, that in fact, their longevity genes, which in fact, when interrupted uh, or enhanced, can influence the lifespan and the health span of these model organisms. Next slide. Also, we now know a lot about molecular pathways of aging. You may not able to see the slide very well, but let me highlight the following. Sirtuin, which is a signal mechanism within the cell, which can activate FOXO and AMP kinase and others, which can activate pathways and genes that improve uh, lifespan of cells. And likewise, mTOR, which increases protein synthesis, actually enhances cell death or cell aging. And what you see in this slide are potential interventions. For example, metformin, a drug that we use to treat diabetes, can interfere with uh, sirtuin or can enhance sirtuin. And caloric restriction can also enhance this pathway and inhibit met, uh, mTOR. And also rapamycin, which is in fact the inhibitor of the mammalian uh, target of rapamycin. So you can see that we have the pathways and we have potential drugs that can affect them. Next slide. And already there are indeed uh, clinical studies that demonstrate on the left-hand side that rapamycin treated a genetically heterogeneous mouse increases lifespan. As you can see, shifting the life expectancy curve from blue to red to the right. And the bottom, you can see the measurements of age-dependent changes in the liver and also in the uterus, which is endometrial hyperplasia. They both decrease as you treat them with rapamycin. In caloric restriction in rhesus monkeys, you can see the life expectancy increases shown in the red, but also in human, there are already some study using markers of biologic aging, which shows that caloric restriction in humans improves the markers of biologic aging, as you can see in terms of uh, the, this graph. Next slide. So there are now indeed clinical trials, rapamycin, as you can see, two trials, and metformin and caloric restriction. So these are not easy trials to undertake. You have to have the right endpoints, but they're ongoing. We look forward to it, and there could be many more. Next slide. Now, let's not forget regenerative therapies. Uh, you already heard about genome editing, and of course, you know about stem cells, and importantly, iPS cells, which are so important for regeneration, particularly uh, the elder diseases are diseases of degeneration. There's reprogramming, which you can use either uh, transcriptional factors or in our lab, microRNA, to directly change a somatic cell, like a fibroblast, to a stem cell, or directly, in our case, for fibroblast, to cardiomyocytes. But I want to point out in the third bullet down there called partial reprogramming. That's a really important breakthrough. Work by De Monte and others show that if you take the Yamanaka factors, shown this slide on the right, he won the Nobel Prize for discovering the factors that can make iPS cells. You take those factors and transiently express them in cells or in animals, guess what? It resets the older cells that clock to a younger cell. And in fact, this is one potential excitement of actually using reprogramming to in fact reduce aging. Next slide. So I've told you a lot about uh, the progress. One important concept, of course, is chronologic age versus biologic age. And of course, you know that chronologic age is measured by you know, how, how old are you since the day you were born. Biologic age is how you do biologically. And I show in this slide because now 
there's in fact epigenetics that people are measuring, DNA methylation, particularly as CPG sites, which is now known as epigenetic clock, that can actually look at chronologic age and whether in fact your biologic age and chronologic age correlates. And you can see in this slide, of course you want to shift towards a younger biologic age and a better score, a low score if you will, uh, than the chronologic age. Next slide. So with that, I'd like to quickly talk about technology because I've talked to you about biomedical advances, but let's not forget technology in terms of emergency response pendants, GPS tracking device, telehealth that's being used quite a bit during COVID uh, pandemic, remote patient monitoring, but also the emerging technology like robotics, uh, avatar, caregivers, wearable systems, smart homes, which I know that in your country, in Singapore, my country, that in fact, you're making smart homes for the older population, which is wonderful. Autonomous vehicles, virtual reality AI, all this should, if we advance it to this population, that we can really help the older population. Next slide. So as I look at technology, it can certainly now and much in the future prevent and manage all diseases using digital apps, you name it, effective prediction and prevention, change the way the care is delivered. Where care is delivered? At home, remotely, who the care is delivered by? Avatar, AI, enable a connected seamless continuum of care and getting great insights from big data, AI, digital, and even digital health assistants, you know, who can help me every day think about making personal decisions and taking care of myself. Next slide. So our grand challenge is to bring these things together. We're asking to seek transformative ideas research that will improve physical, mental, and social health and well-being. So we're not only thinking about physical, we think about mental, but in part, we think about social as well, well-being, as people age. So not only for 65, even earlier as you age, if you improve those aspects of health, you'll be doing much better when you age. So we're looking for ideas to increase health span through innovation, prevention, motility, functionality, social connectedness, and more. And we focus on any stage of life as long as they ultimately promote health as people age. So this global competition is open to any field, not just biomedical, but also business, technology, policy, and social sciences, which is so important. Next slide. This is the design of the competition. We start off with a big base called Catalyst Award. We want to activate, stimulate as many people to come into the space as possible by giving seed um, dollars. The $50,000 per award for one year, if you have a big idea, a bold idea, you don't have to have a lot of preliminary data. I think the whole idea is to get bold ideas to be tested. Many of them fail, but when they succeed, it will be transformative. And for those Catalyst Award, which we have a simple, quick application globally, they have, the winners can have access to Accelerate Award, which is a lot more money. It will be 300000 up to even $10 million. And then the grand challenge, the transformative breakthrough that will win like the X Prize. So that's how we have faced. We have just launched last year the Catalyst Award. We're now starting round two. And of course, those winners are beginning to be eligible for accelerated award and the grand prize eventually will launch in about five years. Next slide. So the good news is we have many countries participating. I still remember the day when I visited Singapore a few years ago, I called my good friend Chichuan Tang, the chief strategy officer at uh, MOH. And Chichuan came to my hotel, we had a drink together. I said, Chichuan, I got this idea of global competition with Singapore, John. Chichuan said, of course. So Minister of Health and National Research Foundation Singapore have agreed to give up 45 awards over three years. And you can see here, we got Taiwan Academy of Seneca, Japan Agency for Medical Research Development, Chinese Academy of Medical Sciences, the European Innovation Technology of Health of EU, 
the United Kingdom Research Innovation, NIH, National Academy, and now Hong Kong just joined us, and so did Chile, and we're working on Australia and others. Because of these agencies, we cover over 50 countries and mobilize over $30 million to date. Next slide. And of course, we launched it last year, a year ago, and we have over 1,500 applications globally. In US, we received 500, 570 applications. You can see we funded 21, but you can see there's a breakdown of our medical science, social science, data digital science, and of course, we welcome all sciences. And you can see that we have a good representation, diversity, and younger population, younger scientists. Next slide. So um, we launched, we, together with Singapore and Japan and European Union, we announced it last year in October 2021. All at the same time, the winners, because we harmonize the way we select and we, you know, in many ways, synchronize the way we do things. So we, you heard, I'm sure Singapore, your winners. Next slide. This is in fact what the United States winners look like, 21 of them. Very diverse. Next slide. And I want to show you a few examples of what's been selected. Anti-aging properties of a new form of non-thermal plasma. Exciting discovery. I look forward to see what that is. Using AI app for smartwatch and phone to detect early signs of Parkinson's. A social science project, Care Corp USA, like Teach America or other you know, movements as a national service model to help aging sector workforce. Nanotechnology, retinal imaging for diagnosis of brain dis uh, disorders through the retina. Avatar, can embodying avatar in our younger self extend a health span? Interesting. Sequencing of genomes. And of course, uh, also gut microbiome. I only use this as examples of what in fact was responsive and selected. Next slide. Okay, so we now uh, just announced phase two, round two, just announced uh, late last month. And now Singapore's announced it and it'll be open for application to March, at least I think six to eight weeks. And of course, I hope that many of you will apply. We particularly welcome the younger scientists, entrepreneurs, innovators to apply. We're gonna hold an annual summit bring the innovators together. Hopefully in September, we'll be able to bring people together. If not, we'll do this virtually, but we're gonna bring not only the awardees, but leaders in health, academia, biotechnology, venture capital investors. And we're launching the accelerated phase later this year. Next slide. So what's the accelerated phase? Well, you know, we've been able to get, as you see at the bottom, um, Japan Ministry of Economy, Trade, Industry, bringing companies together to pool their resources, to pick on the winners to give them more resources to continue research. The European Investment Bank, which is able to invest even up to $10 million per winner, will select the ones that they feel has great commercial potential. Johnson Johnson Innovation, which provides a laboratory for those to scale up their work without taking intellectual property. And then of course, many of these can be commercializable, but importantly, can be translated to human application. Next slide. So this is my last slide. And I think this last slide shows you the multi-dimension in the ecosystem to have health and longevity. Science, technology, social systems, health systems, policy and practice. And together, we'll make a much healthier lifespan for the people as they age. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Victor. Uh, and, uh, you know, that brings up a lot of questions. I think maybe uh, if we could start uh, by taking one step back, you know, a lot of people internationally don't know much about the National Academy of Medicine in the U.S. And maybe you could just briefly give sort of a his historical overview of what it's there for. The, the building, I got to go in for the launch of the Grand Challenge, and it's really awesome. <laughs> I mean, it was impressive. So, Thank you, Brian. Uh, the U.S. National Academy of Medicine is one of three national academies that is in National Academy of Science, that of Engineering and Medicine. 
The founding academy was National Academy of Science in 1863. It was, in fact, chartered by the U.S. government, by Abraham Lincoln himself, and Congress as an independent advisor to the nation in science, engineering, and medicine. Now, you can imagine, back in the Civil War, uh, you know, they're looking at what kind of advice can we get objectively in science, and of course, now we expand it to healthcare and many others. And today, ever more, we need to advise, but not only U.S. Congress and the U.S. government, but all of U.S. and all of globally, which is why we're very active globally. We have, we elect about 100 members a year. They're very distinguished, 10 international and 90 U.S. And by the way, your own Chechuan Tang, John Wong, and, uh, and uh, Wen Tang, uh, three members elected. Uh, you know, they're in very distinguished company because we have 80 Nobel laureates in our National Academy. But what we do, Brian, a lot is this kind of things, that is policy, recommendations to the policymakers, uh, studies, and of course, convening and grand challenge such as this. Yeah, I think it's so important because, you know, it's easy to look at the changing demographics of the world and see aging as a, a major issue. But, you know, the healthcare industry was still sort of ignoring the fact that, you know, that, that so many people were getting old and, and still going about the same old approaches, which are more sick care than health care. And so it's such an important thing that you're doing. I think. Well, let me give you a shout out, Brian. You've been in the forefront uh, for a while, you're one of the leading investigators in this field. You ran the Buck Institute now in Singapore, doing great stuff mm -hmm. and uh, creating cohorts and enhancing basic research. I think we need a lot more people like you. Well, thanks. Well, you know, I wasn't going to say this, but since you brought it up, you know, our Healthy Longevity Clinic is actually up and running as of March 1st. So we're going to have people 45 to 65 coming in. Uh, trying to measure their biologic age and trying to look at interventions to see if we can change biologic aging in human populations. So we're really wow. excited about that. Well, that's so important because unlike a, uh, shall we say, in the disease-oriented population, when you do clinical trials, when the design would be measuring, you have more disease or less, you know, measuring health is not that easy. Yeah. Biologic markers and others, so you need prospective cohorts to study you need yeah. large populations so i'm glad that you're doing this yeah and actually the you know partly in large part due to john wong we're really trying to take a university-wide approach so it's not just healthy longevity but we're thinking about healthy and productive longevity and it's kind of a, a strategic overview of how the whole university can commit to that so i you know i think john's yeah. really leading that so it's uh, exciting well you being too modest, you leading this as well. But you know, I'm also very impressed with Singapore because you know, I come to Singapore frequently. But on one of the trips, I said, I'm going to visit only people who's involved with this field. Mm. And I got to meet not only the Minister of Health, and uh, I even meet the chair of the, uh, of the housing development. Mm -hmm. And of course, in Singapore, uniquely, 80% of housing is government developed. Mm. And so you're able to prospect prospect, think about multi-generational uh, living condition, putting the elderly in the lower floors and the younger on the top floors and have smart homes for the elderly. I mean, that's really great. You have an all of society approach, which is very impressive. Thank you. You know, it's, it's hard to get through a session talking about healthcare without mentioning COVID-19 these days. And and, you know, a lot of people have come to me and said, well, this is going to distract from aging. And, and I think that it's just the opposite, you know, that all of the factors you talk about with aging are, are made worse by COVID-19. Not, not only are older people, you know, more sensitive to complications due to the virus, but you mentioned things like mobility, purpose, connected, connectedness, and all of these things, you know, are, are being adversely affected by by the virus. So, uh, you know, I, I don't know what you think about it, but it seems like it's well, just augmented the challenges of aging. Well, the statistics are very clear. First of all, the mortality. Um, at one point, 80% of deaths were in people in nursing homes and long-term care. But of course, you know, I think if you look at overall, the older population have more severe disease, they have greater mortality, they're certainly more vulnerable. 
Second, of course, as I said earlier, since they are not mobile, or many of them may not be mobile, getting access to things and care is very difficult. Third, of course, is the whole idea of isolation and loneliness. In our country, this is a big problem because many people live alone. They don't live in multi-generation uh, housing. And of course, that greatly exacerbates loneliness. You know, we even see on television in the United States where family members try to come visit their loved ones in a nursing home. They can't go in there. So they have to look at each other by the yeah. window. And that's even more severe. And you can go on. And I think there's no question the older is the more vulnerable population. That simply gives us more resolve to say we need to improve the health and mobility of this population, right? So I think, yeah. as you said, COVID give us highlights the issue that we've been talking about and really in many ways activate us to do more for this population so that they can, uh, you know, deal much better with disease and we can prevent disease with them altogether. Yeah, you know, <clears throat> you mentioned that Singapore is a very efficient healthcare system. And, um, but when you look at a system like the U.S., which is, you know, based on reimbursement and treating disease, uh, how, how do you imagine, it's hard to imagine how you're going to refocus um, uh, so much of that onto uh, healthcare, onto keeping people healthy, onto managing their their conditions in a in a more uh, holistic way. I mean, how do you think about these changes happening in a system like the U.S.? Yeah, well, you know, uh, and even the last administration, um, I think there's been increasing um, attention to this issue, and I'm optimistic with the current administration there'll be even more work to be done. For example, we do have an assistant secretary. Uh, uh, I think it's called Assistant Secretary of Administration and also an HHS, the same person who's overseeing the aging mm -hmm. you know, uh, area. So we've done a lot of interaction with his team. Uh, they supported some of our work, by the way. And in fact, going forward, I think that I look forward to working with the Biden administration to further activate this. I do think there's a lot more interest in it. Uh, by the way, the reason we did the Grand Challenge is to exactly increase the level of interest mm -hmm. of you know, everybody. Uh, for example, uh, as you know, I used to work at Duke and, uh, and I still am on leave. Uh, I would walk across, across campus or anywhere and I ask a young person, what area of research do you do? Is usually cancer, mm -hmm. brain, cardiovascular, Rarely do I hear people saying, I'm working on the aging field. Mm -hmm. I think our hope is to make this cool, make this research cool, right? By yeah. getting more people interested, by giving them seed money, and then being able to start doing things. So creating a movement. So you're quite right. There's got to be more research, more policy, more practice, more changes. Yeah, so I was lucky enough to get about 20 of the U.S., uh... Uh, uh, Catalyst Awards to review uh, last year. Uh, thanks for that, by the way. And <laughs> and uh, uh, what, uh, this year? What, uh, yeah, I think I I think I signed up. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> That's the great. Uh, the amazing thing though is the diversity that you get. I mean, I've never seen a a a, pen, a, a grant system where you get so such a wide array of ideas and thoughts. And and on one heart, one level, it's hard to evaluate all of them. But I think the main point is that it's really exciting to see so many different concepts because i don't think any of us really know what's going to work best in any of those areas you're interested in and we need a sort of a wide way of thoughts and and approaches to sort of test drive and see which ones work the best you know on the selection we actually go through three steps of selection uh for the for the applicants it's easy two page they don't yeah. have a long long grant application, put forward a new idea, you know, right? Yeah. Not a lot of community data, it's just a bold idea. But selection, we go through selection, administrative selection, and then selection with reviews like yourself, although we try to make it simpler, not like a study section. Yeah. Yeah. Lots Thank of you. report, <laughs> we just, just score them, right? Yeah. And then we go through, from your selection, we go through a selection committee, co-chaired by Tachi Yamada, that many of you know, very active in Singapore, mm -hmm. and Bob Horowitz, mm -hmm. the Nobel laureate from MIT. Who was on my thesis committee, actually. Exactly. <laughs> so then we have that, and then we go through 
Once we score them, we go through a special uh, expert committee of people who work in the aging field. So many reviewers are not in the aging field. Mm -hmm. We just look for boldness. And then we go through a final step to validate by the aging field. So it's actually very well vetted. As you yeah. saw some of the selections we made. Yeah, I think it's great because, you know, if you let the all, the experts only review proposals, they tend to get uh, focused on the trees and not the forest. And uh, you need some people that are thinking, you know, at 10,000 feet trying to look for new ideas. Exactly. So, Brian, I think you're so right. Because I would say that the research in aging to date, and this is general generality now, generalizing, mm -hmm. is uh, on geriatric care, on, you know, things like that. But we want bold new ideas that can increase health span. And that's why we want to do it quite somewhat differently. Yeah, and I think one thing you bring up is, you know, the basic researchers like me have been focused really on slowing aging mostly, and the geriatricians are focusing on managing the health of older people who already have multiple conditions. And, and finding ways to bring those two groups together because they both have expertise that's highly valuable to the other, but it's, it's been hard to get those two groups together. So I hope this helps to achieve that a little bit too. That's great. Just one other thought and I'll turn it over to questions that you mentioned health equity. And, and I think that's a great point to bring up because when you talk about slowing aging, a lot of people envision, you know, million dollar approaches to keep billionaires alive longer, you know, and, and, and I think that, uh, we have to find strategies that work for the entire population. And, and that, that puts uh, constraints on what we can do and what we can't. But it's important to think about that at the beginning. It's so important. As you know, in our country, uh, our life expectancy is flattening. That's because while people like me are living longer, there's a population who are dying earlier. Mm -hmm. And this population, as you know, uh, diabetes, obesity, alcoholism, opioid, we call it death of despair. So we want everybody to have the opportunity to live longer and healthier. Mm -hmm. Then, as you say, technology uh, and new discovery has tendency to be more expensive. So we're looking, therefore, for technology, you know, which are less expensive and more equitable. I think the most important thing is to say equity is so important. It shouldn't be determined by the color of your race, the religion, and where you live. We should make available to everyone. And so you're quite right. That's certainly our aspiration. That's great. Uh, maybe I'll bring in a Haititip Tasina. Uh, she's been on the show before, and so I'm, I'm going to disclose the fact that we all call her AIM uh, because... Uh, uh, none ah. of us can say hi to tough. So um, <laughs> he, her nickname is Aim. Uh, and I brought her on to sort of handle questions. But before we do that, she was, as you know, as you mentioned, there were 15 awards given by the Ministry of Health and the National Medical Research Council in collaboration with NAM last year in the, in the Grand Catalyst Awards. And uh, Aim was one of the people to receive that. So I've asked her to just spend 30 seconds or so telling us about your proposal. Thank you, Brian. So yeah, so um, the research that was funded by the uh, Catalyst Award, uh, uh, what I did was that I proposed that we look at a small molecule called pi RNA. So this pi RNA is known to be associated with some of the age-related disease like cancer, but its link to aging has not been known before. So my goal is to uh, find out whether we can use this high dynamics as uh, biomarkers for aging or use them as a uh, potential targets for aging intervention. Yeah, thank you. Great. Yeah, so uh, what is this biomarker again? What is the measure? Pi RNA. So that's the full name is oh, actually oh, okay. PV interacting RNA. Oh, very nice. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, so we'll keep you updated. Uh, Aim, do we have any questions? Yes, we have a lot of questions from the audience, actually. And I, I would like to start with maybe um, maybe a little bit of a tricky question from Dong Lu. Um, so in an effort to fight so-called unhealthy aging, do, uh, Dr. Zhao, do you think it is better to focus our limited resource on getting the currently available approaches to work in humans or 
looking for more novel candidates that we have not yet discovered. This is an either or question. <laughs> uh, I think it's a choice. <laughs> so, um, uh, the keyword is limited resource, I think. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, I think both are important. And in limited resource, I think what you want to do is to choose the things that you feel is likely to work best and have give you much greater results. I don't think it's an all, either or question. Okay, all right, clear, thank you. So, um, yeah, the next How did I, question. Did I pass you a tough question? Sorry, Sam. Uh, you're doing well so far, but the, the <laughs> thesis committee hasn't made a decision yet, so. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the next question is from David. He asks, um, why do you think some countries have not taken the impact of a growing aging population seriously? And what does it take for us to convince the government to pay attention to this? Yeah, I think that the problem, as you can imagine, is many countries uh, are not investing enough in health. And some low low income countries, you can understand, they may not have all the resources. And in other countries, simply acute care is where they're putting most of their money in, right? Because there's demand for hospitalization, for illness. So consequently, of the dollars and resources, they want to take care of the more acute care issues, the disease. And now, of course, you know, in uh, places where continual infectious outbreaks and now COVID, that dominates the, uh, the attention, if you will, and the spending. And that's why I think the older population, which is still small in some countries, although it's expanding, uh, getting less attention. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Shemaine, because just now we talk about um, the, uh, the awareness of the government, but Shemaine is wondering how about the awareness of the public? So do you think public is now well aware of the uh, research on aging and also the approach on how they can um, live longer like, based on the current scientific discoveries? Yeah, I, I think that when, when I saw the... Uh... The video you showed before my uh, lecture, I thought it was just wonderful. I'm looking at, you know, the people who are older, who are active, and I think you're doing a lot of that in Singapore, and you need to do a lot more of that, right? So I think the awareness is increasing, to be sure, particularly since there are more and more people over 65. People in the middle age, I think, are well aware of the issue. Many of them have aging parents. I think it's a younger generation that we need to be sure become a lot more aware. And I think that the whole idea of intergenerational activities is critically important. So I think your point's well taken. There needs to be more awareness, although I think there's now at least this whole area is improving. And I think that the, grand the global grand challenge is uh, contributing to that as well. Right? Thank you. That's yeah. what we hope to do. The, the next question might be a bit tricky as well from Daniel. Um, he, uh, he asks, how do you balance longevity with overpopulation? Ah, well, I think right now uh, that is not an issue per se, because as you can imagine, the older population is only still a, a fraction, maybe 10, 20% of the population. So get living longer would not overpopulate the, the world. I think the question could well be in terms of, you know, uh, when people get older and if you're not healthy, you know, is that going to be a burden on society? And I've already talked about this. Yeah. Maybe one more if you have it. Okay, well, um, maybe one more. So, um... Maybe about the NAM global competition itself. So because I think it's a great initiative to promote anti-aging research worldwide, but uh, its application and selection process, it's actually um, like, it's still quite separated 
per country, right? Is that is there an emphasis on international collaboration? Do you put emphasis yeah. on that, or would would the research or proposal that involve international collaboration have advantage in getting a uh, uh, more plans? Yeah. Well, you know, when we first started this, the whole idea is to get countries interested and involved. So I was just thinking that if you get that many countries involved and that uh, they have to fund their own studies, how would you motivate countries to join? So the whole idea would be to say, you fund your own capitalist award because then your young people and scientists benefit from it. And then we work together versus trying to put everything into one pot that I administer and make decisions. So the beauty of this is that each country will, will therefore start more people interested in this area, right? So then what we did is we say, we need to collect, uh, we, we need to select together. So we use the same criteria. And then we also, at the end of selection, we have a, what we call as a portfolio review. All countries come together, say, what did you select? What did we select? And try to balance the portfolio and learn from each other. So that's why we did it this way. I, I, so at the initial phase, we are focusing on work done within the country in order to start a movement within the country and get more people interested. Clearly that grants which uh, collaborate across countries are well appreciated. Uh, obviously, they will also get special consideration, but we are trying to focus on each country. Well, I think we have running out of time, but thanks a lot for joining the webinar so early in the morning, Victor. It's great to have you. Um, I want to remind participants to uh, click or choose the panelists and all attendees button in the chat box to leave their comments on the show um, and to also register for the March series. We're still selecting speakers, but uh, one of them is going to be Liz Perry. She's the CEO of BioViva talking about gene therapy. Uh, and I'm going to leave you tonight with an excerpt from the video, The Blessings of Aging by Jenny Schweitzer. Thanks again, Victor. I know I'm old in numbers, but otherwise I feel fine. The thing that bothers me is that my kids are 60 years old. I'm staying young and they're getting old. You look in the mirror and you say, oh my God, what happened to that woman? We're old ladies, let's face it. I said, you're going to come into my room one day and I'm going to have a beard like Yasser Arafat. <laughs> I can't see well, I can't walk well. And I have trouble with my hands. Otherwise, perfect. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm all right. <laughs> I'm feeling like sunshine, like springtime, like something's in the water, and I'm taking a deep dive. I'm feeling so weightless, like I'm gonna make it, and nothing. Universe can take this. I can see it clearly now. Nothing gonna bring me down.